Have you ever wondered what the difference is between basic earnings per share and diluted earnings per share? In this video, I'm going to teach you all the essential concepts for earnings per share. We're going to talk about the formula for earnings per share. And then for diluted earnings per share, we're going to talk about how we add back the items for convertible bonds, convertible preferred stock, and stock options. So let's jump in. So now let's talk about the basic earnings per share formula. It is net income minus preferred dividends divided by average number of outstanding common shares. So net income is the amount we earn as a company and preferred dividend shareholders have priority for dividends over common shareholders. So we're going to subtract out the preferred dividends because EPS is focused on how much in earnings is available to common shareholders. Then we take that amount and we divide it by the average number of outstanding common shares to find the amount of earnings after preferred dividends that go to each common shareholder. So that's what basic earnings per share allows us to do. So now let's talk about how to calculate the amount of the preferred dividend. We take the par value of the preferred stock and multiply it by the dividend rate. So non-cumulative preferred stock means there's no guaranteed dividend each year. So if the company doesn't pay a dividend one year, it's not required to pay it in the next. So we only subtract this amount from net income if actually paid. If it's cumulative preferred stock, then we subtract it from preferred dividends, even if not paid. So even if they are just declared, they are required to be paid eventually. So we're going to go ahead and subtract it from net income. So now let's talk about how to find the denominator for basic EPS. So how do we find the average number of outstanding common shares? So we're going to have to find the weighting of each transaction. So I recommend that you solve these calculations using this chart. We're going to write the date the transaction occurs, the type of transaction, the number of shares before we take their weighting, the number of months it was in effect, then find the weighted average by multiplying it by the months in effect over 12. And then that will be our weighted average. So our beginning balance was 100,000 shares. These are in effect for the entire year, so the weighted average is also going to be 100,000. We issue additional shares halfway through the year. So we issue 50,000 additional shares. It's only in effect for six months out of 12 months, so we're going to record 25,000. So then on August 1st, we bought treasury shares. So we bought back some of our company's stock. Therefore, there are fewer shares outstanding now. But since we bought them August 1st, this was only in effect for five months. So we take the negative 20,000 times five over 12. So up to this point, we have 116,667. Then let's say that October 1st, we have a two for one stock split. So what this means is that for every one share of stock, there are now going to be two shares of stock. So we have to double our amount of stock. So all we have to do is take the total balance before the stock split and simply double it. That way our ending balance is 233,333. So now I wanted to give you a few tips for making the weighted average calculations. So first is when you have to count the number of months for the weighted average, make sure you're not counting it incorrectly. So we wanna count how many months was it in effect and then double check by saying how many months was it not in effect. So for example, if it occurs on April 1st, if we issue additional shares on April 1st, it was in effect for nine months out of the year. It was not in effect January, February, March for three months. So we make sure that we're counting all 12 months. Next is how to handle a stock split. So if we have a three for one stock split, we're saying that for every one share, we'll now have a total of three shares. So we're going to add two times more. A two for one stock split means that for every one share, we'll now have two shares. So we would double the amount. And lastly is when we are reporting EPS for two years of presentation and there's a stock split, we're going to apply the stock split to the prior year's balance as well. So now let's talk about diluted earnings per share. This answers the theoretical question, if all of the company's convertible investments were actually converted, how would it affect earnings per share? So think about convertible bonds, convertible preferred shares, and stock options. If they are converted or exercised, they then become common shares. So then the denominator of the formula would increase by those converted shares. And we don't have to take their weighted average, we just count the entire amount. 
And then we have to think about how these transactions affect the numerator of the transaction. So now let's go more in depth on convertible bonds. So now let's talk about how we calculate diluted earnings per share when we have convertible bonds. So a convertible bond means I can convert this bond into shares of common stock. So to find diluted earnings per share, we need to ask, what would happen if this convertible bond was actually converted? We're going to have an increase to the average number of common shares outstanding in the denominator. Additionally, we're not going to have any bond interest payments if it is converted. So we can then add back interest expense. We're going to add back interest expense net of tax. So then the updated formula would be net income minus preferred dividends plus interest expense net of tax divided by the average number of common shares plus the additional shares from the convertible bonds. So as you can see, we're going to have an increase in both the numerator and the denominator. So now let's talk about how to calculate diluted earnings per share for convertible preferred stock. Convertible preferred stock means I can convert this preferred stock into common stock. So if it were to be converted, it would increase the average number of common shares outstanding. And if it were converted, we would not have to make any preferred dividend payments anymore. So therefore we would add back the preferred dividend. And there's no net of tax effect because dividends are not deductible. So we add back the entire amount of the dividend. Now we need to make sure it says convertible preferred stock because if it's not convertible, it doesn't affect diluted earnings per share at all. So let's look at the updated formula. Net income minus preferred dividends. Then we add back the preferred dividends. Then the average complement of shares plus the effect of the convertible preferred stock. So we have an increase to the numerator and the denominator. So now let's talk about how to calculate diluted earnings per share for stock options and warrants. A stock option or a stock warrant means I can purchase common stock for a specific price, the exercise price. So I have the right to purchase this stock. So then we have to ask what would be the impact on earnings per share if they actually exercise these options or warrants. So first we need to make sure that the exercise price is less than the current stock price, meaning that it is in the money. So imagine the opposite example. I own a stock option to purchase a stock for $15, so I have the option to purchase it, and it's currently trading at $12. Therefore, it is not in the money because I'm not going to exercise my option to pay more for buying the stock. I'm going to wait until it's trading at a value above my exercise price. So first make sure it's in the money. If it's not in the money, it will not impact diluted earnings per share. So then if it is in the money, then it will impact diluted earnings per share. It's going to increase the average number of common shares, and it's not going to have any impact on the numerator. So the numerator would stay the same as basic earnings per share, and the denominator would increase by the stock options or warrants converted. So no impact on the numerator and an increase in the denominator.